Well, Lee, you are so welcome here today. You are on this big, massive press trip, but you know it must be just so exciting to be able to talk about the film that you are so passionate about. Absolutely, and th thanks for having me here. It's uh, one of the funnest parts I find about the movie making process is actually getting to talk to people about it when you've made it, because you actually learn a lot about why you made the movie. Mm -hmm. It's good for people to actually dig in and pick apart a little bit of your motivation and why it is that you do what you do. So it's 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 always good to talk. And you had the wonderful premiere at South by Southwest. That must have been, you must have been buzzing just to be around everybody who are so like fanatical about the franchise, like yourself. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was I, I'd been kind of warned in advance and told to enjoy it, that it would be a really fun screening. But when you're presenting your movie to the world for the first time, you don't want to necessarily build up any hype or listen to the hype. Yeah. But the screening itself was, it was, it was like going to a rock concert. And it was a, like a really big theater. It was kind of, it kind of reminded me a little bit of like the Olympia or something like that. A little bit, little bit bigger. Because mm -hmm. um, it's also like, a, you know, it worked really, really well as a cinema. I think they use it as like a music venue and mm -hmm. stuff as well. Like 1,300 people uh, all baying for blood. You know, they wanted, they wanted the experience. They wanted to have a really good time. And um, it was something quite special. There was like, uh, my brother traveled over, he was there with his girlfriend and she's not a massive horror person. So, you know, she was, she was nervous watching the movie, but she enjoyed it immensely, but also enjoyed watching the kind of the waves of, uh, of emotion through the crowd in at, at the time. So it was, it was kind of much needed um, relief from the, the tension and pressure of making this movie, which was a tough one to make. Oh, I'd say so. And how did it all come about? Because this has often been seen as, you know, Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell's baby. So yeah. they must have trusted you a hell of a lot to be like, oh, we, we like this guy. He can do it. That's fine. Yeah, it was, it was in a way, it was a simple enough journey. It, it always takes time when you make a movie. But uh, Sam Raimi had seen my previous film, um, The Hole in the Ground. And he, you know, he was he was a big fan of it right away. And he liked my approach to filmmaking. And we, he asked me, would we go for lunch? So we went for lunch. He brought me out to his favorite sushi place. I hate raw fish. So I didn't, so <laughs> I, just, always away. <laughs> so I didn't, so I didn't eat anything, which gave me more time to talk because I didn't have to stuff my face at the time. And um, yeah, we, we actually talked about lots of different things and like the nature, I suppose, of, of how Hollywood works is when you meet with, because Sam's a producer, mm -hmm. as much as a director, you, you, you know, you meet with a producer and they want to tell you about the things that they have that they're trying to develop or books they might have optioned or even with Sam, I remember the time they'd, there was some board game they'd got the rights to and we're looking how to adapt it to a movie. But being an Evil Dead fan the whole time, I kind of wanted to turn the topic <coughs> to Evil Dead and, and wondering like what what it might be that they wanted to do next. And I think he was surprised when I kind of raised my hand and showed interest. And we just started to talk from there really. And um, quite soon after I, I went to them and, and they asked me, you know, the, the phrase is like, what's your take? Like, what would you do? And I thought about it for a little while and I, and I brought back um, the kind of the pillars of what I wanted to do with the story, how I wanted to expand the universe and adapt the franchise in certain ways. And they were looking for something like that. They didn't know what they were looking for, but when I brought to them what it was that I wanted to do, uh, they felt a kind of a freshness, I suppose, and something a little bit different. So, yeah, and then you start writing from there. You start, you know, you, you earn the blessing. I think Sam's like, here's the car keys and go take it for a ride. <laughs> be be, gen be gentle, but be brutal. <laughs> yeah. And I was joking with everybody earlier to be like, my first question is going to be, you're right, hon. <laughs> only someone that has a little bit of like a sadistic streak could have written that. Yeah, like, yeah. It is terrifying. I, I had an okay childhood, uh, <laughs> as, as it turns out. I think the uh, I think people are sometimes surprised. They maybe expect me to be a little bit more unhinged. And I, when people ask certain questions about the movie, about some of the more brutal or malevolent parts of it, I do find it hard to not smile or or laugh about it. Um, <laughs> Which, it, like, you know, the, it is it is a pretty crazy movie, I guess. At least that's how people are receiving it so far. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's okay. Like, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of happy that that's the response because I, I set out to make something that was uh, that was quite out there. So one of the scenes that I really want to talk to you about was the opening because that is probably the one that connects to the previous installments the yeah. most because it does have that cabin in the woods feel yeah. to it, and then it moves into the city. So before we get onto why you moved it to the city, this scene here. I had goosebumps from head to toe because I am a scaredy cat. I do not like horror films, like mostly, but I was gripped by this. And that was such an iconic moment of her coming out of the water and you kind of go, oh wow, okay, I know what this is. Mm -hmm. Like, how was that to shoot? 
it was challenging to shoot. I think, first of all, the fact that you said you, you knew what it is is great for me to hear because the goal of, in a movie like this, I wanted to have this, you know, cold open, this prologue and give the audience a taste, mm -hmm. a little taste of what they're kind of in for. But to shoot it, like, it was, it was actually really great. We spent three days, like, we said, out at the lake or on the water to shoot that sequence, not including there's, like, an interior part with a cabin, yeah. but the exterior part was three days. And it was great for the crew because we'd spent so much time in the studio, locked in doors. Like, you know, I, I left, I always think back, I left Ireland in, after going through a full winter, went into winter in New Zealand, went into a studio, into dark rooms where I had rain machines outside the windows the entire time, left New Zealand and came back into the start of the next Irish winter. So these three days were about the only sunshine I got in about 18 months of note. Um, it was great. It's always challenging when you're shooting near water. And But for a movie like this, there's so many practical effects. And I, like, there's nothing digital about this. This really happens. This, you know, yeah. this person comes out of the water. She's very talented. Um, <clears throat> but we prepped, you know, just a lot of prep and planning for how that works. And um, yeah, I'll say it was, a, it was a fun three days at the lake, even though what happens at the lake is pretty brutal <laughs> on screen. <laughs> yeah. Now, you touched on it a little bit there, just with the fact that it's not as many special effects, it's all very practical. Mm -hmm. And with the sort of physical demands on your actors to portray the roles, it's a lot of like contorting, yeah. and it is a lot more physical than maybe people would have realized when reading the script. So were you conscious of casting someone who'd be able to embody that themselves, or were you also sort of thinking, yeah, we can probably get a stunt double in for that? Yeah, I, I think making a movie like this, it is very physical. So when I was looking at the cast, it actually w it was important to understand what they could do and part of that process was to look at them both as normal people in their characters but for those that got possessed to get a little sense of what their behaviour would be like and especially with, with Alyssa Sutherland who plays Ellie in the film she actually gave quite a lot of physical performance in her audition tapes which was great and I had a lot of confidence in her but yeah of course you also everybody has a stunt double or two mm -hmm. In fact, like on a movie like this, because there's a lot of crazy requirements. But for the most part, the cast were heavily involved in their own stunts and, and big parts of it. One, one of the interesting things was um, uh, um, young Gabby Eccles, who was like her first movie role, really, uh, who plays Bridget in the film. And I didn't realize till we were rehearsing for, we were doing like technical rehearsals for some of her big scenes, that she'd almost gone pro as a ballerina when she was younger. Oh so she did everything. She had such great internal kind of timing and a clock and an understanding and then her ability so there's scenes where she's climbing down off like kitchen cabinet that's just all real that's just her doing those things so i didn't actually get to learn that about her until we were in the middle of doing it i'd like to claim that i cast <laughs> her for that reason but yeah that was so but for for all the actors there was a lot of physicality and we did a lot of boot camp we did a lot of training like even like little nell fisher who plays cassie like you know she was put through the ringer, the ringer in, yeah. in terms of because you know she needed to get it's not even sometimes just about the physicality of movement it's also the emotional state that that cast had to stay in because the movie crosses a line and nobody's heart rate drops below 180 for the rest of the movie because their lives are in danger the entire time so we did a lot of planning for that as well working on like breathing mm -hmm. movement and the confidence you can give actors as well when you kind of fill up their toolbox with all these ideas and ways of getting to the places that you need them to be yeah, and actually, I have to talk about Nell Fisher because mm. for someone so young, she is just captivating on screen. Like, Alyssa was fantastic as well, and I loved how, as she was getting more and more possessed, it, the more intricate all of her movements became. But I do think that Nell is just such a big star on the rise, and she yeah. was brilliant as a terrified youngster. <laughs> yeah, she was really special to work with. Like, she's more emotionally intelligent than me, uh, and she, like, t t she was clearly a very smart kid from the get-go. And you've got to do a lot of preparation. I've worked with a lot of young performers before. You, you do need to get them into the right headspace and kind of I talk about like filling the toolbox. They, they, they need to know the places to go. The joy of working with Nell is she had so many places that she could go. And what was really interesting for her is in some of the more emotional moments, she'd come on set with her chaperone um, and I'd maybe explain to her what it is that we're doing and she'd always be really well prepped and know what was, she'd know what was next. But she was confident enough to say to me, okay, please leave me alone for 10 minutes. She's nine years old because she wanted to go and she would go away and get herself in to the necessary emotional state for the scene. And then we'd roll camera, she'd be there. She didn't take a lot of pushing or probing to, to go there. And it was kind of weird to see this nine-year-old go into a corner and start to get herself ready to cry mm -hmm. and then come on camera and turn it on. It was quite amazing to experience, actually, That's to observe. Incredible. Yeah. And 
uh, sorry, I'm just really blown away by that yeah. because as much as you could see on screen just how talented she was, just hearing that as well, you're like, mm -hmm. wow, she's she's definitely got it. She's very special. But all the cast, like there's lots of great, you know, footage behind the scenes. And as we roll camera before, I'd call action on something of everybody having to get themselves into the height and state that they needed to be. There's lots of star jumps, lots of running around, lots of people screaming, fully screaming to get themselves ready so that they felt like open for when the action actually started. Yeah. Lily Sullivan loved to do that. She would just, I'd have always know from doing a shot with Lily and it was an, an, an emotional moment or something big, I'd take my headphones off because she would scream full voice before we'd actually start the scene. So you'd know not to be like deaf. I didn't want to blow my ears, yeah. Very, very fair. Um, you're clearly a massive horror fan, mm -hmm. even though you joke, I don't know whether you joked outside that you're actually like not a big... I can be, <laughs> I can be a scary cat. cat too. Like if something scares me, the light's staying on that night. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. Yeah, I will say for, for the grudge, I slept with the light on for about a week. Yeah. So, and I nearly did with this as well. <laughs> but there's a lot of nods to other horror franchises, not just the Evil Dead franchise, but to a few other films as well. So which was your favourite that you managed to include in? Because I have to say, a lot of the time for little Easter eggs, they do feel a little bit forced in there, but for this, they all just seem to make perfect sense as they were logically there. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I think what's in one of the interesting things to actually to, to note about that is sometimes people point out things that you didn't realise you were influenced by. That actually <laughs> happens quite a lot. And then there are some intentional ones. There's obviously the ones that are directly related to Evil Dead, but I think people... The moment people saw the trailer for the movie, they noted the, the blood coming from the elevator. Yeah. Like The Shining is one of my favorite movies of all time. And I pointedly will make a Shining reference in I think everything I ever make. There's one in The Hole in the Ground, my previous movie. There's yeah. one in this. There's there's some in even some of my short films. And I'm working on a screenplay at the moment. And a couple of weeks ago, I wrote the, the little Shining moment into it where somebody trips up over a tricycle in a corridor in a hotel. So I, I do like tipping my cap. I like, like part of the... Part of what horror is also is the, the the referential nature of it and leaning into the familiar but doing something a little bit different with mm -hmm. it. But with the blood elevator, for example, which is probably my favourite because it's actually a huge scene in the movie, people will know from The Shining, the blood eggs oh. in the elevator. But we never saw what happened inside the elevator, but I go there in this film. Yeah, and I have to ask, how much blood did you use? Because it just seemed like you hit a point in it and then suddenly it's just blood is everywhere yeah. for the rest of like the last like 20 minutes or so blood is a character in this movie and when i was when i was working with um uh, brendan dory was his name who's like the head of physical effects for the movie like we we spoke at length about how i wanted the blood to behave in the film so all the blood in the movie is is real and it's proper sticky movie blood it's not sometimes you no know, corners are cut with you know, water with red food coloring Everything in this was sticky. The actors, when they got this blood on them, it was hell, like for them. And I do feel sorry, it would stick their skin to their skin. You'd lose hair. It was like, it was, it was, it was pretty brutal. I think that was the actor's least favorite thing was the blood, yet they knew there was so much of it to, 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 to be used. But <clears throat> with Brendan, I kind of kept, um, I kind of kept tally. So when you're directing a movie, you get asked a lot of questions and you ask a lot of questions. That's a lot of what the job is, mm -hmm. that communication. And my last question making this movie, when we wrapped and all was done, my very final question on wrap was to Brendan. I said, so how much blood did we use? What was the final number? And it was six and a half thousand litres, which is a, a lot. And that's all created from scratch. We had to hire an industrial kitchen <clears throat> to cook this blood, basically. You need to you know, create it with corn syrup and all these things and the food colourings and all that stuff that needs to be done. And I'd been specific about how I wanted the blood to move so that it was kind of like slow and creepy. Um, but yeah, six and a half thousand litres of blood. And the last, I don't know how many litres it was, but I got about 10 litres of it dumped on me by my lead actor, Lily Sullivan, <laughs> uh, when we wrapped as, as payback for what I put her through with uh, the blood along the way. I would say very fairly. It was, you know, I, I, I couldn't complain at that point. Yeah. You were just like, come on, bring it on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and another thing that you've managed to sort of make reference to in this is there's a few Irishisms in there as well, a few references to home. And considering Ireland does have such a like strong connection to horror, you know, like Bram Stoker and all that, yeah. how nice is it to be able to honor that side as well, even though you're making this absolutely massive Hollywood blockbuster movie? Like Yeah, it was it was again it was something that would be kind of important to me from the start because I'm proud of where I'm from, I'm proud of Irish culture and my own heritage. So it's actually quite fun like the book has a few Celtic influences in it. The, like the opening page on the book has a symbol that was based on, on like, you know, ancient writing. Um, and also it never quite made the cut, but there's a set of car keys that feature as a character throughout the movie. 
and the key key ring on it was a leprechaun but we never quite shot it right that you could tell ah. which kind of bugged me a little bit and there's celtic influences in the music as well at times um, and e on top of all that one of the things that i'm really proud of and excited by was the fact that i was able to work with my producers from ireland on the movie and then to bring the movie back here to do post-production and work with loads of amazing irish talent my composer Stephen McKeown, who worked on my previous movie, so many brilliant visual effects artists here in Ireland and sound design team. That, that's really important. So there's like, you go to the cinema and watch this movie and you sit through the credits, which I hope you will, because yeah. you're going to need a minute to calm down after what you've just experienced. But yeah, you'll see so much Irish talent involved in the movie, which is something that's important to me. It's part of what I want to also do with my career is make these big movies, but be able to also bring them back, shoot them in Ireland, work with Irish people. Um, it's yeah, it's 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 part of who I am, and I like to make it part of my work too. And is it true that when because Bruce Campbell was over in Ireland yeah. while you were doing post production, is it true that he dropped in to be this like, so how's it going? Yeah, well, I think Bruce liked the uh, excuse to come to Ireland for a while, but <laughs> Bruce also loves the post sound process. So he came to Ireland for about a month and got to experience seeing Dublin and, and hanging out and doing all these kind of things. And he's a very social, nice guy to mm -hmm. to uh, engage with. And then every two or three days, I'd say, hey, Bruce come into the sound studio, check out what we're doing. He's a real sound geek, like he loves that aspect of things. And he provided us with a hard drive of um, all the original sound, sound effects that were recorded like analog for the first movie back in, I guess when they shot that movie, it was like 79 or 80, yeah. like it was released in 81. Depends depends where you are in the world, but- The it early was, 80s yeah, anyway, it, it, was, it, was shot, it was shot late 70s. So we had all the original wind effects that had been recorded, oh, the sound wow. of buzzing flies. and. I started to then bring them, we were deep in the sound design process, but I started to introduce some of those things in. So within the soundtrack, it's kind of woven into uh, the structure of it. There's some of like the original sound effects as well. So that was a nice gift that Bruce bought. And then I gave him the gift of Guinness and watching football, which he, <laughs> which he vibed with massively. I'd say so. And as we were saying earlier, that this opening sequence is set traditionally in like the cabin in the woods, but then you moved it to the city. Why? I just felt like it was time for a change. Like. It's something I've spoken about before in the, the process of making this movie. I love Evil Dead, but had someone said, hey, it's got to be in a cabin, it's got to be like this, I probably wouldn't have done it because they rebooted the franchise in mm -hmm. 2013 in a really effective way. I love that movie. I love Fede's movie. I think it's super scary and super brutal and terrifying. But I wanted to do something different. I'm a filmmaker with my own voice, you know, my own vision, my own ideas. And I wanted to, I kind of always felt, and I always liked the idea that you could take the strength and power of that evil force but bring it somewhere else and use it in a bit of a different way and the city just felt like a natural place to do that i wanted to tell a story about family as well mm -hmm. that was kind of important to me yeah and with like horror being kind of your forte at the moment what is it about horror that you're kind of like yes i'll i'll go into that genre i don't know like it's it comes from childhood there's my next i have three siblings and there's an eight year age gap between me and my sister who's oh, my wow. next sibling and everyone, when I was growing up at home, everybody liked horror movies. My dad liked horror movies. So, so basically, the um, when I was younger, I was just exposed to all these films that I probably shouldn't have seen at such an impressionable age. I'm glad I was, because it had an impact on what I'm doing now. Um, and I think I was just drawn to it. I was always entertained by watching my family be scared by things. Because often I'd be too scared, I'd be hiding yeah. behind a cushion or behind my hand, but I'd be watching their reactions. And I actually learned quite a bit about the filmmaking process that way. I didn't realize it at the time. But I remember, I'll tell you a really quick story about The Shining, because I said it's a movie I'm really yeah. passionate about, but I saw that at way too young an age, didn't understand it, but then was terrified for many, many nights afterwards. And my dad was traveling for business at the time, and he came home and was getting the rundown on how have things been, and it was like, well, Lee's been a basket case. Why, we showed him The Shining. That wasn't clever, but reminded him that he wanted to see it again, because he hadn't seen it since it had been in the cinema. And I learned about the power of sound in movies because he rented it. I didn't watch it again, but I was lying in bed and I could hear the movie again. And it scared me as much as when I'd seen it with my own eyes. So there was definitely uh, a love of horror and the Halloween season and all of that stuff when I was growing up. And like most of my family were kind of into it. So it was kind of inevitable that I'd be impacted and affected by it. Yeah, like uh, when you just mentioned things about the sound there, all I could think of was the sound from this scene as mm -hmm. well, because it is so impactful. It's like, that is something that's going to haunt me for, yeah. for years. So you're right. Yeah, like the power of the, the score is just yeah. as influential as, you know, the storytelling and the, the action sequences. Yeah, the set over this shot in particular, and we've got a big title that rises up in the sky. That's a, a big moment, but I wanted that to be the kind of 
shake it all about, like show everybody what this movie is about and be this big kind of gutsy operatic, but also like hit you in the chest kind of moment because it's, you've got to get conditioned for what's to come afterwards. Yeah. And that's what that scene was all about. And did you deliberately have a little hole in the ground reference there as well? Where's the hole in the ground reference? I'm trying to remember. Oh, there is a hole. There's a hole in the ground. There is, there is a, there, yeah. I was like, yeah, I've had that brought. Yeah, there was, there was. So that wasn't then deliberate, was it? Because when you turned there, oh, there's a hole in the ground. I was yeah, like, yeah, there's, there's, there's a hole, yeah. It, it was part of the story, so it kind of made sense. I always, I do like the idea of basements and dark places and undiscovered things and like what's just beneath our feet. It's like that, I, I always think about just basic creepy things, like you could buy a house and not know that someone buried someone under the patio, for example. These are the things that I think about. So the things that are bubbling beneath the surface can actually be quite creepy. And there's a couple of other tips of the cap as well. Speaking of the key rings, because keys play a little part in the a tiny little part in the story, and there is a shot very late on where you see a family photograph in a key ring, and the design of that key ring is directly out of my short film Ghost Train, which I made many years ago. So there's a big Reaper character in my short film Ghost Train that sits on top of this old dark ride, and that Reaper sits on top of the key ring in this because the family are actually on a ghost train in the yeah. photograph. So I like those little those little internal references. It gives you something to think about, or when you're asked to make a choice, it's it's fun to connect it back to things that you've created before. And it's quite surprising to me when I was sort of going through all of your back catalogue and I was like, hang on a minute, this is only your second feature length mm -hmm. film? Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, it's number, it's number. I wish I'd made more, but you know, it's it's a it's a it's a slow, challenging game to get movies made. So oh, I, I understandable because this has yeah. been in the works since what is it, 2019? 2019 was when I first met with the guys. I developed the storyline during 2019. That's the thing, when you're when you're developing ideas, you're actually usually developing three or four different projects at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you're you know, you're trying to back a few different horses, which one will like win the race. Yes. Um so I developed the storyline during 2019 and pitched it in detail to, to the guys and they were really on board. But then I wasn't available to kind of start writing it till about March of 2020, which was right when COVID hit. So I wrote this movie sitting on my bed, trapped in an apartment, and it kind of really helped inform the claustrophobia that exists yeah. in the movie because I was living through that in a, in a certain kind of way at the time. Um, and then, yeah, wrote, you know, wrote the script for a number of months, did a number of different drafts, found our studio partners in, in, in New Line and Warner Brothers in kind of autumn of 2020. And then in the February, I'm locked in a hotel room in, in New Zealand to get through managed isolation so I can go out and make the movie. I was there for eight months. It was a long wow. time. Yeah, it was a long shoot, a long prep. And then returned to... Uh, to Ireland for post-production which went on for another 10 months yeah so it's it, it 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 dominates your life it takes up a lot a hell of a lot of time um so you gotta love it and you gotta find an idea that you're willing to live with it's like it's like going on a date you know and you're like could I could I live with this person for three mm -hmm. years you've got to really and then I ended up living with this this kind of madness you know you've, you've <laughs> got you've got to you got to my producer John Kevill often says it to me when I'm hunting down different ideas make sure you're comfortable with the fact that you're gonna have to have this hanging over you for such a long time. And then if you make it, you've gotta live with it forever. Yeah, and like even like in, in my job, they always say it's like you have to live and breathe what it like what you do. And yeah. that's exactly I think you're you'd be similar with filmmaking, is that yeah. you have to be as passionate about it as you possibly can be, or else people are going to be able to tell that you're not actually as into it. Yeah, it's it's kind of vocational in a way, right? You know, yeah. you 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 definitely got to live and breathe it. I feel that. And then it also wears you out. Yeah, oh, no, but looking back on it now, you must be just like, oh, there's my baby. On I'm the glad screen. it's done. <laughs> I'm glad it's done. Never say never in terms of going back, but it was it was a challenging movie to make in in a great way. But it was very physical. Mm -hmm. It was very full on, and there was a point in time where I just didn't have a day off for like six months because you're working Monday to Friday. You're you know up at five a.m. You're on doing some quick rewrites, maybe on set by about seven, getting home about nine in the evening. And you know, trying to get, some, trying to eat, trying to handle your emails, trying to, because you're constantly getting asked, especially in a movie like this, you're dealing with so many new effects and stunts that are coming up. You're constantly having to approve things all the time. Um, so there'd be hours of approvals at night for something that's coming up in three days or five days, or we need an answer now so that we can prep for that big stunt that we're going to do. And then the weekend rolls around and go unconscious for a few hours, and then start rewriting for the next week because I constantly. I constantly meddle with my own words. I can't stop. <laughs> you got to keep it going. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to say, like with A Hole in the Ground, that was, I think, a real moment in Irish cinema, especially within the horror genre, because 
it kind of started that train of a series of quite good Irish horror films. And I, but it was the first one where everyone just went, that's how you do it. Yeah. And it was, must have been a really nice thing for yourself to be like, oh, oh, thanks, guys. Yeah, it was, <laughs> look, it was nice. I think there's a lot of great genre filmmakers in Ireland and they've been, you know, knocking on the doors in different ways over the years. And there's been, there's been some successful things and some less successful things. But that's also movies full stop, right? Mm-hmm. Some things work better than others. And I think I, I have a good team of people I work with and we knew in approaching the hole in the ground that we couldn't emulate Hollywood. We needed to give something that had a really Irish identity. But I had confidence in my own ability that I could put it in a kind of commercial and international rapper that people around the world could watch it and and luckily that happened and it's it's a weird journey like little things like someone was on your mind to me the other day that um the hole in the ground was like the number one movie at the mexican box office on its opening weekend wow you know just like these uh, uh, these oddities around the world you know and it was like again it was it knocked in in i think it was had a moment in peru as well where it knocked dumbo off number one for like again a weekend or something like that so it is kind of amazing to think you tell this kind of small contained Irish folktale, you know, get a great cast in, have a great crew of people. And then, you know, people all around the world are going out to the cinema and buying a popcorn and a drink to watch. To me, that's the greatest reward of all because I think about audience more than anything else. When I'm in a room working with somebody and talking about the film I'm making or working with a writing partner, like audience is the most Mm -hmm. used word. And this probably audience and blood, but (laughs) but, but audience, audience is the word that matters to me because I'm really focused on making commercial movies. I want people to go into dark rooms and have an experience together. Yeah, and look, if this is your second feature length film, I just can't wait to see what else you have going on like down the line over the next few years. Like, I just think it's gonna be absolutely insane if this is only number two, That's it just blows my mind. But before I let you go, I would like you, if you looked into this camera right here. This one here? You just give us one big pitch and get people into the cinema to go see it. Wow, okay, give me a second to think about that one. <laughs> um, I think that sometimes Irish people get a little bit put off by horror movies, but this movie is super scary, but it's also super entertaining. It's a roller coaster. It's 90 minutes of pure entertainment, something you've probably never quite seen before. So definitely buy a popcorn, get your friends. Your popcorn's gonna probably end up on your lap or on the floor at some point, but I guarantee you, you will have a good time if you watch this movie.